Hi, Victor. Thanks for making it here. To speak, you can just hold down on the microphone icon and should be able to uh, oh, talk. All right, so yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. So we were at time, so I think I'll go ahead and get started and want to welcome everyone here uh, for this presentation of the uh, BWEC Expert Series on Artificial Intelligence, How AI Will Shape Tomorrow, Insights from our Expert Panel. I'm really honored to be hosting this. It's a distinguished panel. And, uh, you can. Uh, um, Ireland and Turkey and the US all coming together who are actively using AI or are working with AI and researching AI to uh, bring together an uh, excellent series. I can see your uh, uh, audio uh, moving when you're not speaking, so if you just mute, mute the mic when you're not talking, that should take care of it. So uh, the expert series right now is um, running with the uh, team, or, or our panel here. Uh, first is Victor Winter, who is an AI expert at the University of Nebraska Omaha in the U.S., and um, then um, Murat uh, Gomez, who's from CAG University in Turkey, working with AI, and then John O'Connor at the Technology University of Dublin in Ireland. So really an international panel today that reflects the kind of support that we have here, uh, and uh, just glad to have them all here. Uh, one thing that uh, we want to do with this panel discussion is not just talk about how the individuals are using it, but also where things are going different implications for education particularly, but also the broader context for our society. Um, to, uh, to kick off the meeting, um, I'll just say I'm uh, Eric Moore, and I'm from St. Martin's University, and uh, already using artificial intelligence there, but really would like each of our panelists' discussion to uh, self-introduce and briefly say what you're doing to or either engage or use artificial intelligence in your work. And uh, Murat, if I can start with you, I'd appreciate it. Sure, Eric, thank you. Um, I'm from Turkey. I'm a marketing professor, and um, I've been using AI since the AI became popular immediately. And uh, the moment I heard about it, I tried it, of course, and then I was kind of amazed two that they came up with for, uh, for us to use. So I'm, I'm, I'm just here representing a professor who is using actively AI as well as um, who is observing the students who use AI in different ways. So I will try to give my reflection to that tonight um, on the um, how these kind of technologies and AI um, affect our society and how should we use it? This is my reflections on those. So briefly, that's it. Thank you. All right, great, thanks so much. And if I can uh, move on to John O'Connor. John, if you could introduce yourself as well and what you've been doing with AI. John? Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you. So I'm John O'Connor. Um, I am the strategic lead for the European University of Technology at TU Dublin, which is an alliance of nine universities across Europe. Um, I've been doing that for about the last three years. Before that, I was Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities in the university. Um, before that, I was Head of Art and Design. So my own professional expertise is in design, um, but I've 
followed an early interest in what we used to call multimedia in the 1990s, um, which led me to teaching here in Second Life for the last 15 or so years um, and developing other, I suppose, uses for technology. <clears throat> um, I'm interested in AI from a more general perspective in terms of its the, the philosophy behind it, what it really is, uh, what it might offer to us as um, a society, and what the potential dangers might be. Um, I work with the European Culture and Technology Lab in our university, which specializes in, obviously, culture and technology. We're interested in the implications of technology. Um, and we take a very broad view uh, around the definition of technology. So I'll speak a little bit to that topic um, later on. Thank you, Letty. That sounds great. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, Victor, if you could introduce uh, your engagement in artificial intelligence. I'd appreciate it. All right. So uh, I uh, joined the faculty at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in 2001. And prior to that, I was a principal member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories, which is the uh, weapons laboratory uh, in, the, in the United States. It's, it's, its history is that it is it, had created, it has created all, all the atomic bombs in the United States' nuclear arsenal. That's its sort of origin story. But it does a, it does a whole bunch of things since then, right? Um, but it's that kind of a lab. And so we were, I was hired there to do formal methods and high assurance to high assurance software construction methods. So that was sort of traditional symbolic AI, which is not machine learning based. And uh, so 2001, I, I moved to academia. And then as of November 30th, 2022, that's when ChatGPT got released to the public. Uh, I was kind of all in on that. And so prior to that, I, I also, uh, for the past, let's say, 10, 10 years or so, I've been intensely interested in adaptive educational technology. So I, I believe that the world needs to know more about more computer science, more coding, all this kind of stuff. And so that was my pre-ChatGPT uh, mission. I have a, a, a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit called bricklayer.org that has a whole bunch of free stuff for K-12 education. And I was writing a book uh, for uh, curriculum for middle school computer science education. And when I, it was at around that time that, well, while I was writing this, that ChatGPT came online, right? And then I used ChatGPT to uh, develop lesson plans for the teachers to accompany the book and also work extensively to uh, do software development. So interactive web pages that somehow uh, uh, lined up, aligned with the educational goals of lesson plans. So, so I've spent many, 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 many hours uh, building all kinds of web, web pages, interactive stuff. And now I'm kind of, uh, I'm going to be teaching a course in generative AI at the university starting next year. And also uh, I'm exploring sort of higher level uses of these systems. Like there's sort of like, a tr I think, a a progression that happens when people engage with this kind of technology, right? The first, the first kind of engagement is like writing a poem or something that you might have on a birthday card or something like that. And then sort of the next one after that might be like letters of recommendation. That's sort of a, a sweet spot that a lot of people can kind of get an understanding of. And then there's uh, more advanced kind of interactions, which is like software development. And then more recently, as these systems become more capable, you can actually teach them to do stuff. So that's kind of like some of the experiments that I'm doing now. I think that sounds great. It's actually uh, right in line with some of our questions. So I think we can explore those things in more depth as we uh, get into it. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Victor. I, th I think it's a, uh, a great uh, uh, div diversity of perspectives that we bring to the table today, and so that's why I'm really glad to uh, uh, be here and be a part of this. It's uh, 
also really about hands-on. What are we doing with AI? What can we do with AI? I think as we were planning this together, uh, that really was one of the themes that we could get into the um, mathematics behind AI and look at some of the things that are going on there. But, but I think what most educators really need to hear is like what's really happening now that's usable. And that leads us to our first question, which frankly, you, uh, actually each of you have already gotten us started in that direction. And so let's go to it and maybe uh, have a round of uh, a question or a responses to this question. Where is the technology of AI going in the near term? And uh, where can we see uh, usage occurring? So uh, I'll start uh, again with you, uh, Magla, and uh, we'll just kick it off uh, with this particular question. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric, sorry. And the, um, well, where it goes is like, I usually compare the technologies when we see it with the previous ones. Like we had the internet, how, how it evolved, how we started to use it, and then how the society accepted it, and then, you know, today, where we are now. So uh, if you look at all those things, all the social media before, uh, kind of those revolutionary technologies, um, they, it, it took time for them to spread and use by the um, society. But in AI case, or the metaverse trend, which uh, was the announcement of the metaverse, came with the mm, Facebook calling themselves meta, it, it becomes so trendy in the media, and then it, 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 it all becomes so fast everything right now, that it spread it like a virus, maybe even faster than the COVID-19. So it is, now we are in a time or we are in an era where things happen much faster than before. That is the difference. And we don't have a society enough time to adapt ourselves to that. And the, another thing with all those technologies in common, I would say they are not the cure and the cures. I mean, they're not all good, all evil. They're not uh, just good or bad. They, ha they are all man-made, so they're human. Um, invented them. So they are inherited the human's features, human's uh, specialties. Uh, we are not as humans all good and bad. We do mistakes, uh, we do good things as well. So all those technologies are how they are used is going to be in the same path, like all as the human. So now the AI is in a stage uh, where they say they say it's the you know in, in a primitive form still, but then it is very useful and very effective. I was not expecting this. You know, I was thinking that okay, these kind of things might happen in the future, like a science fiction. But then, not in one year, not in two years, that we we were uh, in the last two years, it happened. So it's kind of very, very um, surprising for me that they had come up with that technology for everyone's use, uh, almost like free usage as well. I mean, you can pay for some AI tools and stuff like that, but then. Now it's free. Everyone can use ChatGPT, for example, and um, it can do certain things that you were spending a lot of time before in in a uh, very very short time. So it is amazing where where it is even right now. So um, it's very hard to predict what is going to happen, but of course there will be some uh, resistance from the society to accept it totally or we will need the rules and the regulations and so on. And the problem here is how can we teach as the professors or the academicians to the younger generation to use it in a responsible way? To exactly. Use it in a yeah. you know, Thanks so much. I, I really agree with your idea of the speed and pace change and yeah. the broad public acceptance is very uh, is very telling for these technologies. Um, it's okay, I'll, I'll move 
uh, along to Don. And uh, Don, if you can give us your initial thoughts about this as well, uh, where do we see this technology of AI going in the near term? And what stuff can you see as some usage? Okay. Um, I actually had a, a kind of a five minute presentation prepared, um, and I have it in speakeasy to help those who like to read while they're listening. So I'm going to try the beginning of that, which somewhat addresses your question and will keep us on topic, uh, but I won't go through the whole presentation. Um, that sounds good. And we can get it, I mean, I th I'm hoping to be able to go through the questions uh, fairly yeah. quickly, and then we'll have time later. You can completely finish that if you like as we have okay. the time. If, yeah, if it's relevant, I'm happy to, but I'm, I'm happy to, I'm flexible. Okay, so I, I wanted to start by reminding us all here of the key message from Marshall McLuhan, um, the late 20th century media theorist. We show our age if we remember him. But he advised diligence and attention, and he recommended that we maintain awareness of what is happening around us rather than becoming distracted by the continuous chatter of our contemporary world. We need to keep our focus on the technologies that are driving development, and he urged us to scrutinize the emergence of new and highly sophisticated technology, warning that while we shape our tools, thereafter our tools shape us. So what he foresaw at the beginning of what he used to refer to as the electric age has now materialized in the digital era, a realm where our tools not only shape us, but define the very essence of our humanity today. Our digital era is characterized by the relentless march of technological progress we find ourselves grappling with the unforeseen consequences of our past creations, the internet, virtual worlds, VR headset devices, along with our topic today, the advent of generative artificial intelligence, and they've become the building blocks of our digital existence. But as with any technological revolution, the pace is actually being set by entrepreneurs and profit-driven corporations often at the expense of broader societal considerations. Ethical and social responsibilities frequently take a back seat to the pursuit of innovation and financial gain. We need look no further than Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter recently to see the impact of one powerful man's drive to satisfy his ego, overriding any and all needs of the community or the greater good. John Carmack, former chief technology officer at Oculus, has suggested that virtual reality might become a viable economic alternative to the natural world in the face of dwindling resources. And David Chalmers, the Australian who is now professor of philosophy and neuroscience at New York University, appears to endorse this view. He argues that VR is real, writing that virtual worlds are not illusions or fictions. What happens in VR really happens. And he goes on to add that life in virtual worlds can be as good in principle as life outside virtual worlds. You can lead a fully meaningful life in a virtual world. On the other hand, it would seem that a recent wake up call has emerged from the AI community itself urging us to recognize the existential threat posed by artificial intelligence. Their call to action is clear. Mitigating the risks of AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. Some go further, suggesting a doomsday scenario to be triggered as AI develops consciousness at some indeterminate date in the near future. This imminent singularity, when technological advancement surpasses human intelligence and becomes irreversible, is posited by some in the sector and is partly responsible for the AI Safety Summit hosted by the British government last year. So let me leave it there for the moment, Mehdi, um, and we can pick up on, on anything else I have there if it's relevant later on. 
That sounds great. Thanks so much. I, I really appreciate all the, the references, too. I think this gives our, our audience also a lot of uh, strong points on which to uh, dig deeper as it goes on. Sure. And, uh, and just to note, I, I have a note card that I can share at the end, which has all of those references um, in it. So don't, don't, don't worry about trying to take notes now. Um, I'll be sharing all of this afterwards for anybody who wants it. Yeah, I invite our audience to reach out. And uh, so we'll move on to Victor, if I can uh, ask you also of where the technology of AI is going in your term and uh, how can we see use here? All right, so listen, first I want to say that I have a uh, YouTube channel called Frontiers of Tech where I'm like posting various like little clips of stuff that I do and one of them is a news update that I am trying to do every month, like to show you how quickly this stuff is evolving. And so, uh, so I, I agree that it is, uh, it's way beyond Moore's law that's happening here. And so, and in part, and video will tell you this, right? So in Moore's law, if you look at, uh, at how long, how much of an in increase in computing power would you get in 10 years? You get roughly 100 fold increase in computing power. So to acquire a million-fold increase in computing power would take 30 years, three decades. And so if you look historically, you take sort of pretty much any 30-year period and you see how much the world has changed, it is astonishing, right? Uh, and that's just looking back. Now, from NVIDIA side of this equation, right, it is their GPUs that make it possible to train these ever-larger neural networks. And they have, in the past 10 years, increased their computing power for their GPUs for this application one million fold. And they are on track to do it again in the next 10 years. And so when I, I gave a talk about some of this stuff in the fall, and back then, you know, when I was like getting information for, for the presentation and slides and stuff, like around the June time frame, NVIDIA had just approached a uh, $1 trillion evaluation, $1 trillion. Right now, so this is just a few months later, right? It is worth $2 trillion. So th this should say something, right? If you look at like uh, uh, JP Morgan, there's like a growing number of exer experts, not just within the tech sector, but that they're saying this, this will have a bigger impact on society than the internet, sm the smartphone, and broadband combined, right? And for those of us, and I think the, the people in the panel here, right, that have been experiencing this since the very beginning, since uh, November, November 30th, 2022, uh, it is astonishing how much the capabilities of these systems have increased. And it's not only that, it seems to be accelerating. So for example, uh, Google just, sorry, OpenAI just released Sora, which is this video generator as a, it's not an art generator not an image generator but a video generator right so you you write in a prompt and it will generate up to one minute of video and it is very very realistic and so uh, uh people weren't the experts weren't expecting this technology to be at this level for another two to three years right and so uh so it kind of like shocked everybody when they released this uh and the problem, right, so, so this stuff is, is, I believe it's accelerating. I believe it will, I've seen this kind of stuff, this kind of a curve when you talk about like computer chess. I used to play chess uh, back in the 80s and stuff in 90s where computers were like, you know, they were doing okay. And uh, I saw sort of this dismissive attitude by a lot of people about chess and computers would never be intelligent and they kept moving the goalpost to, to what it meant to be intelligent and they literally got to the point in 1996 where Gary Kasparov, who'd been studying playing with computers, he had an understanding. He said, a computer will never, ever be a world champion. Never, ever. And he said, because it lacked a soul. And so for, for me, when I hear the lack the soul part, that's sort of the last line of human defense. That's the intangible stuff, right? I just refuse to accept it. You can never, it's just, just subjective. And of course he lost the next year. There's at least some contention as to how that happened. But if you look at what like AlphaZero has done, right? what machine learning is capable of 
no human will ever, ever beat one of these systems ever again. Never. And so uh, it's that quick, right? <laughs> and the, the, the machine learning stuff only came on the scene sort of relatively recently, and it's only because sort of this critical mass of size of the neural network had been reached, right? And so it's, it's, it's snuck up on us very, very quickly. And so there are all these questions like, you know, are we getting ahead of ourselves on this kind of stuff? And are we going to create AI that kind of spins out of control in certain ways? And I think that that is a very real threat. Um, it, it, in part, I think that threat is, it comes from a couple of different directions, like, you know, greed and all this kind of stuff is, is one of them. But it's also a little bit of a denial to recognize its full capabilities, right? So I see a lot of this stuff now, and you guys probably all do too, where it's like, oh, it's a chatbot, it's a, it's just probability the next word, it's, you know, it made a mistake, so I guess it's really, you know, just gobbledygook in some sense, right? So I think that is like missing the whole point of this stuff. This stuff is, is absolutely amazing, and I don't know if you, how intensely you guys keep up with this. I don't mean the panel people, but like just the audience in general. But uh, Gemini Ultra became available in February. And earlier this week, uh, Claude Opus from Anthropic became available. And these things are off the charts, right? They are just truly amazing. And if you work with them a lot, like I do, right, you can feel the difference between these kinds of, these, these upgrades that are happening. And of course, uh, OpenAI with this uh, ChatGPT-5, if any of the rumors, if even a small percentage of these rumors are to be believed, it is going to be a complete game changer. So, so the problem is, right, and so here's the, uh, you know, so one option is, okay, let's kind of like take a step back, and in some sense that's where, where Anthropic came from, it, right, it split from OpenAI because they had a philosophical difference of how to move forward. But, but the problem, uh, the way I see it, right, is, and this is from my experience working at Sandia Labs. So Sandia Labs was, is in part a weapons lab. It does other stuff, right, but it is a weapons lab. So we did have meetings with Pentagon people and stuff like this. And they basically, the way I understood it, right, is they said if there's a 20-year gap in technology between two opposing armies, it's lights out. There's no chance. The army that's 20 years behind has no chance. And so uh, the, we're kind of confronted with this problem here, right? So uh, Saul Khan, you know, he gave a, a TED talk on this, and he kind of put it in a pretty good way. He said, look, if we put the brakes on, the, the responsible people, right, they put the brakes on, and the irresponsible people say, leave the pedal to the metal. The, w the worst scenario that we can come up with is where the irresponsible people have more capable AI than we do, right? So I don't see a good answer for that. It's kind of like in like the nuclear arms race in some sense, right? It, it, it does no good if one side says, hey, let's not do this anymore, and the other side just keeps going. And so that, I say, that, that okay. really sets the context for uh, in the biggest way possible for what the societal impacts are and I really appreciate you bringing that to the table. Also, all three discussions bring a big uh, historical context, and there were so many references in there. I'm going to be spending time in the closed captions later. <laughs> but that's really amazing. Yeah, I, I want to keep us uh, moving through the questions a little bit here, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't pick up on any body language, so like, like when I'm supposed to stop. So yeah, just feel <laughs> free to interrupt. <laughs> hey, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, for me. I don't want to interrupt because each of your presentations have been so amazing so far, and just want to make sure we're getting the uh, context for uh, each and enough time for everybody. But we'll move on to the next question now, which is um, uh, so. And this is brings. All that context, focus, and history back to how is AI creating the opportunity for different in-world education experiences? As we're uh, working in this virtual space, interacting with characters and doing things like that, how can this impact what we do? Uh, thanks also, John, for the uh, link in the Guardian. Uh, but uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Magua and 
maybe what's happening in world that you're seeing is uh, viable, is changing the space in VR, Sector Mike, or other things like that, where uh, we could see virtual uh, world spaces change in how we experience them or how we educate. Magua? Um, the, yeah, the AI is, um, we're using it as professors right now, and uh, how I use it, I started to use it is was basically my dean asked me uh, a new course uh, if you could create something uh, about uh, sustainability and the social uh, responsibility. So what I did was, and it was the first time I was introduced to the AI myself uh, during that time, but nobody else in the faculty knew about that. And then uh, I went there in my room, and then in five minutes I got a syllabus prepared by AI. And then I print it out, and then it looks good. Like, it, 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 it doesn't, you know, uh, seem too bad uh, to show to the dean. And I, I decided to go to his room and then just show it to my dean. And my, my dean is a, um, in, in real life, uh, he's, he's an ex, ex-military guy, and then he's into technology and cell. But then um, he, he's, he's uh, probably going to be retired soon. So, and then... You don't expect him to, you know, figure out AI right away. And then um, I just show it to him. He said, he, he looked at me and he read the paper and then it was good. And he was kind of shocked because I couldn't do it in five minutes after he asked me to do that. And then um, uh, he started to ask me things after that, like, can you ask your friend, which refers to the AI, uh, if you're going to do a social responsibility project at the faculty, what would that be? Can you ask your friend this? Can you ask your friend that? So he started to ask me these questions. And then the moment I learned it, the second day I went to the class and showed it to the kids, show it to the students. And then I told them, okay, um, use it. That is, that is dumb not to use it for certain reasons. But then use it in a way, combining with your own soul or combining with your own mind to the work that you're doing with the AI support. So because if you combine these things, AI is creating that syllabus for you, but then you get you, you make that human touch. That is, that is what is missing there, human touch, in my opinion, m- most of the things that the AI creates. But then, uh, as uh, Victor said, mentioned that it's evolving itself. The problem here is, my, my, my question is, like, AI is doing things on the given data, and it's collecting the data. And then that data is human-made, right? It, we are creating that data. So it includes our biases. Then the AI's decisions or the AI's productions will be with those biases as well which we try to avoid sometimes. And that is the challenge in my mind. Like, I I, I couldn't pass that level in my mind. So briefly, that's it. I really appreciate that. I think that discussion exemplifies a lot of what we're seeing with executives, with management, with military leaders, with education leaders, with societal leaders and politicians. There is an accessibility there and a an intuitive understanding about this leap that's going on. Uh, John, from your perspective, how would, how would you see this happening? Yeah, um, j- just to preface it, the, the um, link I put into Mustafa Suleiman's book um, is worth checking out, and, it, and it, it echoes what Victor has said about the speed of this development, that even the people involved in this technology don't really know where it's going. They can't tell. Um, it's exponential, um, way above Moore's law, as he said. Um, and that really leaves us with existential questions. And I, I'm going to pick up on <coughs> where I left off because I was d- kind of about to move into that area. Um, That's good. Thanks. So the, the, the proposal that um, <coughs> AI and VR and all of this can provide solutions to everything, we ha- all the problems we have in life, is kind of viewed skeptically by people like David Bates, who's the founder of the University of Berkeley Center for New Media. 
Um, he questions the validity of predictions prompting us to scrutinize whether AI, AI which is nurtured, and this is what Michael was saying, is nurtured on flawed and questionably biased human inputs. And he asks whether that merely perpetuates existing knowledge and offering scant comfort stifles the emergence of the truly new. A colleague of mine, Noel Fitzpatrick, is Professor of Philosophy and founder of the European and Culture and Technology Lab um, at the European University of Technology, argues that artificial intelligence as a form of artificial stupidity is the lack of abstraction, the lack of the ability to think, overwhelmed by the sheer vastness of the data and the size of the task. Now, I'm conscious that that's what we're talking about there is AI based on large language models. And as Victor said, there are other forms as well. Um, so we're talking about a specific kind of AI here. But it certainly is the one that's to the fore at the moment. But Noel goes on to articulate his concern, um, which is that at the root of this technology, and that is the assumption and the widespread belief that everything can be measured and therefore, by extension, that everything of importance is measurable. That all problems can be solved through the development of bigger data sets and more powerful computational modeling. Certainly, though, among that debate, or in that debate, one certainty does emerge, and that is the omnipresence of AI and VR in our future. And that fact for me, demands a paradigm shift in our approach to education. In a world with access to unimaginable quantities of raw data, alongside the continuing exponential growth of digital processing capabilities, it becomes imperative that we equip the citizens of tomorrow with skills that transcend the mere acquisition of data and information. They must become proficient in the generation of knowledge that can be adapted to different circumstances and applied to analyzing and solving problems. As digital environments continue to evolve, students need to learn not only how to navigate these realms, but also cultivate distinctively human attributes, discrimination, spontaneity, and creativity. Attributes that I claim at the moment distinguish human intelligence from artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's a very big factor. I, uh, I continue to wonder as I advise students in career choices and in topics of study, that very question, how much will we be doing that? Um, and uh, where, where sh we should we send them that won't become a dead end because of some technology shift? Uh, but uh, great points, John. Uh, Victor, if you can also uh, bring the perspective or, or your perspective to the table on uh, maybe these broader issues that we've been discussing during this question, but also on anything that may be occurring in the uh, metaverse in virtual worlds that might relate. Okay, yeah, so I think that when it comes to uh, the metaverse, and so I, I'm part of my adaptive educational technology pursuit right, is, uh, involves uh, using tech. And, and, and the simple examples of this is like interactive web pages, and the cooler examples are uh, metaverse kind of stuff, virtual environments and video, 3D video games that have educational components to them and stuff. So, that, that, so I'm very excited about this. So one of them, I would say that, uh, you know, if you look at like large language models and non- NPCs, so non-player characters, bots. And there's an enormous potential for that, right? And so I think the, the thing that everybody's kind of holding their breath for right now is this uh, Grand Theft Auto 6 or whatever that's supposed to come out in 2025. And so all of the characters, all the NPCs that they have, right, previously you had to kind of write scripts for them and stuff, you give them personalities and stuff. And so this is going to change fundamentally, right? Everybody's expecting a huge shift with this kind of stuff. Uh, these non-player characters can also be educators too, right? So uh, so I think that for me, I'm really, really excited and I'm kind of 
you know, when generative AI first came out, I was like, okay, let me wrap my brain around this a bit. Uh, and when they'll stabilize, <laughs> then I can kind of move and, you know, transfer this across. But it's not stabilizing, right? It just keeps getting better. And so it's kind of a moving target. If you build for something with current set of capabilities, uh, you may be far afield uh, six months from now, right? Or a year from now. So it's a little, it's it's kind of, kind of strange, right? I, I want to use... One of the things that I'm working with right now is I want uh, to, I, I'm interested in teaching to scale. And so that, you know, think, think of MOOC, right? And so the problems with MOOCs in the old days or the original MOOCs is that you really don't have much feedback. Uh, you definitely don't get access to the professor. And so, uh, so I've been playing around with having uh, a large language model, in this case, Gemini Ultra, be uh, be my TA, and uh, the initial experiments are uh, fascinating. I mean, unbelievable, right? So I'm super excited about this. I would say that um, I do want to say a couple of things at what what Murat said, and also what John said a little bit. The bias thing is is huge. It is a huge, huge, huge problem, a challenge, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so, like, I've given some talks uh, to the insurance industry. I've been invited to a couple of things. In fact, yesterday I, I gave a talk to the leadership of Physicians Mutual, which is a pretty big insurance company in the United States. And uh, bias is at the center, right? Because what the insurance industry is supposed to do is discriminate. Uh, kids have higher accident rates in cars than adults, so you should there should be some form of they have to pay more than the adults. It's this kind of stuff. So you, you're supposed to discriminate. That's what makes the company competitive. However, there's certain forms of discrimination that you're not supposed to do, right? Uh, discrimination based on race and so on. And so if you want to use machine learning in this space to exceed what traditional statistical models can do, uh, you get to a, a place that's unexplainable, right? You give it a bunch of information, it comes up with a risk profile for an individual, and then you kind of want to make sure that that calculation didn't take into account Ways to make distinctions along those kinds of lines. So really, really, really hard problem, and it uh, hits hits industry and in particular the insurance industry. Um, the uh, the thing about uh, what I see with the educational space is that uh, uh, I I think these things are are actually in incredibly intelligent, and so I, I, I I'm not so, I'm not so sure I'm, I I let. I agree with the stupidity thing, but but it is you know it's something to look at. Uh, is it just sort of uh, is there nothing new coming out of this? And uh, I think those are all good questions to ask, right? But like they they predicted, uh, I think people have predicted that within the next five years, uh, uh, AI will write a New York Times bestseller. And then you sort of get into this kind of stuff. And if you look back historically, right? If you look at like Voltaire and stuff. He said that basically everybody's copying. And this is you know, hundreds of years ago, right? Everybody's copying. There are, there are new, new ideas. You just steal other ideas and change them. And they have these kind of statements, right? It's like good, good poets follow and great poets steal. So this idea, right, is a, it, it is cent central to what's going on here. Um, I think I, I'm more positive on this kind of stuff. I think that, uh, 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 and I think it's impact impact on education is enormous and if it's done right can be done in, the, in a good way the assignments have to be ambitious they can't be like it for computer science in particular so I don't know if you guys have played around much with having it do software development but in some sense this is a, a killer app this is like the best it's at its best <laughs> in this space I think and uh, that's great uh, so uh, yeah I will keep it uh, going here but thank you that was um, amazing uh, the um, uh, or, or the keep our cycle going. The um, the next uh, we're getting questions coming in from the audience already, and I'd, so I'd like to at least put some of those on the floor. But this time, rather than have a question, I'd like you all to say what you think is most important as we begin to move the direction towards the audience. This is uh, for me very, again, uh, just very uh, grateful that we we can have a discussion at this depth. Our questions that are coming in are related to critical thinking and ethics. How those work? Generally, and in K-12, we've got some questions coming in about um, the hidden biases, how you would actually work these things at scale, 
and, and watch them and um, uh, teaching at scale, things like that. So um, let's, let me just open it up so that uh, others can, uh, or, or so that you can all, all both express your uh, most significant points you'd like to bring today as we move to our last 15 minutes. And then uh, also, if you want to respond to any of the things coming in during the next round, I'll, we'll maybe uh, open that up specifically for the audience. But uh, right now, uh, Magla, if you could go ahead with maybe a closing set of points you're interested in or in response to anything I've presented. Okay. A um, couple of things that I would like to add to the discussion that we have been uh, doing here. And um, one of them is like, I, I'm, I'm looking at from a perspective of a business professor or a marketing professor, so that we have seen that uh, they're using AI for marketing purposes as well. But then the problem is this uh, marketing campaign, uh, there, there's, um, there's a uh, TED talk that I watched that was from uh, Dr. Tufekci, another Turkish uh, scholar, but uh, he, he lives in the U.S. And um, in, his, in her speech, and um, she said uh, about something, uh, an AI was running a campaign, marketing campaign for, um, for a casino in Vegas. And uh, the goal for the campaign is uh, AI was going to pick up the best candidates or the best uh, customer, uh, customers that could be potential uh, to be a best customer for the casino, right? And then um, the problem is AI came out with a result which is totally immoral, which is AI picked the people who are in borderline or uh, they have vulnerability psychologically. And that data was gathered from the um, social media. Uh, kind of, uh, they, they, they look at the people who are in borderline, they would be most uh, suitable people who would gamble more. And then uh, they kind of uh, look at the profiles of those people and try to stop those people who could be or going to be uh, having a psychological problem in the next uh, next next uh, couple of weeks or whatever months. So that that was the thing uh, the AI did. So the morality there, like how are we going to balance that? Like yes, it is. It's maybe it's a good business decision for that campaign at that time, or maybe it's a good uh, profitable decision. But then. How can we set the rule there to be the moral as well and do the right thing for AI? Another thing is for uh, use in the business case um, is um, they use AI for hiring people. And for hiring people, uh, guess who AI eliminates uh, in the process? Uh, people, uh, women who is uh, likely to be pregnant in the near future where uh, the ones first uh, cut out from the list. And uh, also for a higher manager role, they were not choosing women because the data came to them or the given to the AI was mostly the man in that company was the successful managers in the past. So those are create, you know, those are kind of following the, all the things that we try to avoid following the, all the biases that we have, all the immoral things that we try to avoid, but AI keeps doing the same decisions or the same mistakes that human makes. That is the problem. That is the thing. So yeah, that, that is yeah. business perspective as well, yeah. how they use the AI in the business and so on. I think that's in a, 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 that is worth like a whole course right there. And I think something that we, especially uh, people who are teaching, need to be critically aware of. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that perspective. It's something I'm really glad we got into this meeting, uh, Magla. Um, and as before, uh, John, I move on to you. I'd just like to say there's uh, another comment that's closely related about revealing bias and uh, risk and also the uncovery of intractable issues that are coming up as questions. But uh, Don, if you want to have some closing remarks now, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Mehdi. 
Yeah, just picking up on, on where Magra finished off, um, so I don't know how many people are aware of the concept of AI hallucinations, um, which is where AI presents a response which to all intents and purposes seems accurate, seems reliable, and seems true. Uh, the example we tend to talk about in academia is where it, ref it cites a paper. The author is real, the journal is real, the title of the paper in the, in the journal appears real, but actually isn't real, it's made up. Um, so in fact, what's happening is the AI is submitting an incorrect solution. But with typical human um, ingenuity, instead of referring to it as a mistake or an error, we refer to it as a hallucination. And the reason I quote that is because there is a tendency that I see to anthropomorphize AI the way human beings want to anthropomorphize everything. And it's leading us astray in terms of understanding what's actually going on. So large language models fundamentally are predictive tools. Um, that means they're predicting text. They're not actually understanding language and presenting solutions. They're simply predict predicting the most likely um, outcome to a text response. Now that obviously gets more complex as you move on into images and so on. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, we create AI. It's, it's created by our data systems. And no system that we create can either equal us in terms of intelligence or surpass us in terms of intelligence. A closed system can't really break outside of its own system. So we need that means we need to be very careful. Um, clearly, the technology is developing at a phenomenal rate, and it can do things that humans can never uh, um, expect to do. And as that rate continues, it's going to get far outside our ken in terms of understanding what's going on. But fundamentally, we need to remember that we're the ones who are supposedly in control and how we apply and use what comes out and emerges from AI is really important. Um, one of the examples that one of my colleagues gives, Noel Fitzpatrick, who I quoted earlier, is we have a bus station in Dublin which has an Irish name. It's called Bus Aras. And as he says, his mother always referred to it as Buenos Aires. So if anybody is familiar with malapropisms and this is malaprop in the well-known play, you'll understand that kind of play on words. Now, no matter how much you work with an AI, it's never going to be able to produce that kind of play on words and it's never going to be able to understand the connection. But as Noel says, everybody in their family knows when his mother says, oh, I'm off to Buenos Aires today, Everyone knows she's not going to South America. She's actually just going down to the bus station. Um, just to kind of finish off the, the last sentence or two of what I prepared, because it addresses that, um, and it's in the face of this technological development. What I think society needs are, is individuals who can discern and create amidst the rapid evolution of our tools. And I'm certainly clear about my responsibility as an educator. And that is to guide students, not just in mastering the technology, but in preserving the awareness of their own humanity while engaging with the most powerful and potentially perilous tools we have unleashed in the world so far. I think one of the interesting things that came out here, um, and Victor mentioned it, is how he's using um, AI in terms of programming. Uh, and I think he referred to it as the killer app. And I think that's a really interesting uh, suggestion because we, different disciplines in academia are going to be using AI in different ways. And I think that's something that we should really remember that there are so many different applications for AI. There are so many different potential ways of using it in education the onus uh, on us as academics and educationalists is to, to try and understand what it is we're dealing with 
and then to begin to look at how that's going to affect the area that we're involved in, in terms of expertise, and at the very least, bring an awareness of that to our students, who are going to graduate as citizens, um, and prepare them to be able to deal with what effectively is the unknown and the unforeseeable at the moment. But to do wow. that with the confidence that human beings can always be in control of our own destiny and where we're going. And while we may not always be in control of technology, we certainly need to keep an awareness of the impact that technology is having, not just on us as individuals, but on society as a whole. Yes, that's, I think that's it. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think part of the goal of panel discussions like this um, Thank you so much. Hey, there is a lot going on in the chat right now, as is typical for this series. And if people are asking questions and replying and providing comments or more supportive materials and things like that, I really encourage that. This has always been a great group for that. But at this time, I'd like to ask Victor, if you can uh, uh, wrap it up for us with uh, your comments, I'd appreciate it. Uh, how many minutes do I have? Just th there's a cu couple of things I'd like to say. So uh -huh, it's about five minutes. Okay. So Okay, cool. So, um, uh, one thing, you know, so the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said that all truth passes through three stages. It's ridiculed, it's violently opposed, and then it's accepted as being self-evident. So I remember in the chess days, when, when computers started out, right, chess was the pinnacle of the example of what it meant to have intelligence. It was the pinnacle of human achievement, was chess. And that was the, the yardstick by which computers were measured by, right? And scientists, mathematicians gave proofs that a computer could never beat a human at chess, never. And then Go, the proof was even more profound, right? So the, the goalposts are moving. Now, uh, I think with the, uh, the anthropomorphized stuff, there's kind of, there's a yes and a no there. So... So I think, you know, they've done studies with like language models where they gave them sort of these, one of their weak spots, at least the earlier ones in particular, was these word problems. So math, kind of elementary school math word problems. And they gave, I think it was the palm. They gave the, it a test and it scored at 30%. And then they gave it the test again, but in the prompt they said, before you answer the question, relax and take a deep breath and it scored an 80%. And if you just said relax, it scored like a 78%. Now, those kind of thoughts as to how to get the best out of these models, you kind of can only can come up with these ideas if you kind of anthropomorphize them, right? And so, uh, so it, at the end of the day, right, if you think, if, you get, if I'm gonna get nerdy for just a second, in, con in the theory of computation, you have at one end of the spectrum finite state machines, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have Turing machines. Turing machines, no general questions can be answered. For finite state machines, all questions can be answered. A computer, technically speaking, is a finite state machine, theoretically, but it is not illuminating for the individual interacting with the computer to think of it that way. You know, you're, it, in fact, it's detrimental. So it's much better to think of a computer as a Turing machine, even though it isn't. And so, for me, the, the whole whether it's sentient and all this kind of thing is somewhat, it's an interesting philosophical thing, but it's more, for me, I'm more about, like, what mindset should the human have when you're interacting with this stuff to get the best out of it? And so, uh, so for me, I, I, it's, I don't see it as a human intelligence, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Star Trek fan, so I don't have any problems with uh, non-human <laughs> stuff, right? Uh, but I, I, I believe, and I think there are people that work with these a lot, they'll say the best that you can get out of these is if you actually treat it like it's human. Like there's a, I think some dean of some some big school in the East Coast, and that was his number one uh, advice, treat it as human. If you can, if you can do that mental shift, you will, you will kill it in the, in the world of AI. And so I think there is evidence to suggest, and, and, it's, and the way I see it, it's, bes it's beside the point, it, whether it's a, whether it's, Sentient or not is at this time not so much the point. It's how you go about asking and interacting with it. And after all, it is trained up on 
the knowledge of mankind as defined by the internet, right? So it kind of intuitively makes sense if that's how it's been molded to approach it in that way. So I'll stop, I'll stop, I mean, I can go on, but I think I'll stop there just because it seems like I've, uh, yeah. And I guess the bias thing, one, so that was really interesting too, I think this, this gambling example is really, really uh, important. And one of the things that um, Sam Altman said is that well before these things acquire superhuman intelligence, they will acquire superhuman persuasive capabilities. And the problem with, that's hard to regulate, right? Because that affects all industries. You can now hire the best PR firm in the world to advocate for you, to lobby for certain kinds of legislation. And so I don't know how to stop that one. The picking on vulnerable personalities, absolutely, right? But that's what PR firms do. Right? When somebody's trying to, sh to shape your thoughts, that's what they do. These guys will just do it better. <laughs> right? And the firing thing, that's terrible. And the promoting people based on, that's also a compelling example of, the, we do not want these systems to propagate or amplify any of our societal distortions. Right? Yes. So it's a huge problem, huge problem. Yes, I see that really happening. So my background is cybersecurity and we're seeing these as layers of the cybersecurity stack that all organizations will have to address moving forward. A, this has been an amazing panel discussion. We've hit the top of the hour. I don't want to let it stop here. We have one hour of uh, discussion. And uh, first, I just want to uh, thank the, the panelists so much for this in-depth, insightful, and content-rich discussion that we've had. And uh, I'll allow it to uh, move forward here if we have uh, time to uh, keep things going. If our panelists can stay for a bit, we can either take questions from the crowd, and uh, as as the questions, uh, uh, the speed of those coming in lowers a little bit, we can move over to the discussion area and break out even into individual discussions. Uh, but um, thank you so much, and I want to have the audience join in uh, in the chat and. Uh, thank, thank everyone here for all these great things. We'll try to get some of the questions that are flowing in rapidly here as, as soon as we just uh, take a moment for that. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, also, our panelists, any other uh, uh, parting uh, 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 words, something you want to say, just uh, feel free to jump in right now, and then I'll, I'll look to the uh, questions and see if we want to uh, take some of those. There's one thing that... Uh, I have to say, it's, it's slightly off topic, but um, I was just interested that Victor mentioned the lab that you were working in, Victor, which was responsible for the development of all the atomic uh, bombs and, and weaponry in the US. Um, and coincidentally, it, this is the evening that the Oscars are being awarded. And my fellow Irishman and actor Killian Murphy is up for uh, Oscar for Best Actor for his role in Oppenheimer. So I just thought yes. I was curious when you said you had worked in that space. I, I, I think that's fake, so I guess he's going to get the Oscar then, huh? <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> that's the odd, right? <laughs> yeah. had, the thing, maybe. They, just so you know, right, they had, back then, when they were doing the bomb, they didn't know what was going to happen, and when they did it in White Sands, they had three news articles prepared. One is if nothing happened, oh the bomb was a dud. Two is if yeah. it did what it was supposed to do. And three, if it got completely out of hand and ended up killing people in a nearby town and stuff. They had those ready because yeah. they didn't quite know. At least, maybe not, maybe not Oppenheimer, but the others, right? There were a lot of people that yeah. were skeptical that this would work at all. Oh, I can imagine. And, and we're in that situation now where it, really the only thing we can advise to people, I think, is to keep an open mind. It's very easy to, to come down on one side or the other and think, yes, AI is going to resolve everything in the future, uh, we have problems in the world, or to be skeptical and then get stuck in your own echo chamber. We, we actually don't know where this is going. This is technology um, at a level that's so advanced uh, and the cleverest people in the world are working on it. Um, so we just have to keep an open mind, uh, but we have to engage with it, and we have to find a way. I really like the, the quotation you gave, uh, Victor, from that dean in the East Coast School to, to say, treat it as human. I think they're the kinds of metaphors we need, 
uh, that help us to begin to approach this kind of technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. I think, and I think it's important to uh, have a strong uh, pushback on it too, right? In the sense that it, it, if, if you look at, if you use the atomic stuff, uh, if you've ever seen one of these old movies, they literally, uh, when they did the, the Pacific, uh, the the Pacific above ground bombings, right? They had the ashes falling down on islands where there were people, and the kids were playing in the atomic ash, right? Because they didn't really kind of think about how bad this stuff really is. They didn't quite understand. Um, I was born in Hawaii and in the in the 60s, and my mom said that they would tell you in the news when they did the Bikini Island bombing, do not look to the south tonight at 7 p.m. <laughs> stuff like this. I mean, it's unthinkable in modern times, right? So yeah. it is it is important to uh, subject this stuff to scrutiny, I think, uh, in, in a big way. And, and I agree. The, uh, the open mind stuff, there's a cool quote from uh, Arthur C. Clarke. He wrote this, oh, yes. uh, this uh, essay, right? Fail Hazardous Prophecies or Failure of Imagination, which is this thing about, you know, be careful about what you think you can predict. And 